the store is going to open at 3 in the morning. And you're like, what kind of idiot would do that? I wasn't talking to you, Siri. Uh, yeah. Don't say that because it happened in Sunday school this morning. You're going to get somebody mad at you. No, but it's true. But when the stores are open at 3 o'clock in the morning and you say, what kind of idiots would go there to all your friends and then you're there? You know, I love it. Jim Gaffigan does this comedy routine about how people dress to go to McDonald's because they don't want any of their friends to see them there. You ever notice they're there at Black Friday at 3 o'clock in the morning. Everybody's got sunglasses and ski hats because they don't want any of their friends to know they really got up and went. But do you believe that that's going to happen? So do you believe that the things that Jesus says are going to happen? Do you believe enough to get rid of your doubt? Because why would you doubt? Why would you doubt? Why would you doubt when you get your newspaper ads that the stores are going to be open and there's going to be a sale? Why would you doubt the TV commercials? So why would you doubt the Word of God. Why would you doubt our Creator? We live in a world that the majority of the people doubt now. Oh yeah? And then what's happening is they're, they're kind of like, I, I love, Dave has, is teaching the book of Hebrews. He's doing such a great job. And today there's not an empty chair in the whole Sunday school classroom. And I'm so blessed by that. And, and uh, I even heard talk, they were talking about moving into a bigger room. Increasing the venue is what they call that in the rock concert circuit. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. You do such a great job. But you know, as we teach the book of Hebrews, it's about the Jewish world causing Christians to cave and not believe anymore, as it was going on back then. And what we're seeing today is that Christians are caving in their beliefs. You know, the amount of Christians that go down in a literal belief of a literal six-day creation goes down every year. Did you know that? More and more Christians are like, wow, science has kind of proved that that's not true. You know? It's easy to believe men over God, isn't it? But why would we doubt? And do we believe Jesus? Do we believe what Jesus is? Do we believe that He is the Son of God? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And before we go into God's Word, let's do what we always do. Let's pray. God, we love You so much. And we thank You for all the announcements that You've given us of things that are going to happen. And Lord, we just ask that You would be with us today and help us to hear Your Word through the Holy Spirit and decide firmly that we believe You. Because everything You've ever said has happened. And there's no reason for us to doubt. Touch each and every one of us today to serve you in the way that you've called us to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to start out with Mary. And I, I want you to know that at the time that Mary had Jesus, she was 12 and thir or 13 years old. And a lot of people believe she might have been 11. Okay? And, and people were shocked to hear that. But you understand... There was the ritual of the man, of, of what they went through to say they were a man, okay, when they were like 12 and 13, but women were considered a woman, woman the first time they had their menstrual cycle. They were actually a woman. So Mary was 12, 13. There are actually people that say that she could have been 11 when Jesus was born. A very, very young girl. She was a very, very pure girl, and she was a student of God's Word. The Bible tells us that she loved God, and she followed Him, and she was a student of what God had to say, and, and who He was. She truly loved the Lord. And, and we're going to talk here in the Scripture of an angel appearing to her, and, and I love the reaction as you read this account as, as Mary has told this account of how a young girl that age would have felt with an angel appearing to her, telling her, I, I, would, I, I want you to think about this as you read the grace of her words, the, the poise that she kept, and it helps you to understand even more why 
God chose her. It says, one month later, God sent the angel Gabriel to the town of Nazareth in Galilee with a message for a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to Joseph from the family of King David. The angel greeted Mary and said, you are truly blessed. The Lord is with you. Mary was confused by the angel's words and wondered what they meant. Then the angel told Mary, don't be afraid. God is pleased with you and you will have a son. His name will be Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of God most high. The Lord God will make him king as his ancestor David was. He will rule the people of Israel forever and his kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I am not married. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come down to you and God's power will come over you. So your child will be called the Holy Son of God. Your relative Elizabeth is going to have a son even though she is old. No one thought she could ever have a baby, but three months she will have a son. Nothing is impossible for God, Mary said. I am the Lord's servant. Let it happen as you have said. And the angel left her. Okay, so the first thing we see is that the scriptures tell us that the angel Gabriel is the one who came. Gabriel is God's announcer. He makes all of God's announcements. Okay? He's, he's God's herald. Okay, if we, we want to talk about heart, the herald angels sing. I used to think that was something about my Uncle Harold's angels when I was a little kid. I used to think it was actually heart, Harold's angels. Harold's pretty weird, too. But anyway, it, it actually is a herald, an announcer, and many theologians believe that upon the rapture and the trumpets of God sounding, that the first trumpet will be blown by Gabriel. That's not scriptural, that's what people believe. Okay, there's even been songs. Anybody ever heard a song about when Gabriel blows the trumpet? Yeah. So that's what a lot of people believe. So Gabriel comes and he sees this young girl. And she's engaged to a guy named Joseph. Now, that's because they've been dating for three or four years. Right? Probably went to a lot of the high school football games together. That kind of stuff. You know, we, we don't understand that's not how it worked. You know, basically, in this situation, what happened is the two families knew each other. Joseph saw her and thought she was a pretty girl. He, he liked some things. And so he basically told his dad, buy her for me. And they were betrothed. If it didn't happen that way, it was a business deal set up that neither kids knew anything about. Okay? So when we read this, a lot of times our minds go to America. And these two kids spent a lot of time at the Olive Garden together. And they really just enjoyed driving around the town, looking at all the pretty Hanukkah lights. Oh, come on, that's fun. But the angel looks at her and says, you are blessed. Gabriel tells her that you are blessed. You have been chosen for this mission. I love this. You are blessed. You are blessed. God is going to make you an outcast. You're going to be pregnant without a husband. You're going to have everybody in your hometown want to stone you. We have no record of Mary's parents ever speaking to her again. Do you know that? None. And the odds are they probably didn't. Because she said yes to God. And she did a very heavy duty thing. She heard this announcement and she was willing to go through it. You are blessed. Don't be afraid. How could you not be afraid? Knowing everything that's going on. You know, I, I, I tell you something. Some of you have watched my weight fluctuations through my 13 years at the church here. So this might surprise you, but I have never been pregnant. Okay? And I watch women go through pregnancy. And I think it has to be terrifying. I think every bit of it has to be terrifying. From the time that you go through pain, I've seen the I've seen it through women's teeth. I've seen women become diabetics through being pregnant. I have watched women be sick at their stomach for anywhere from three to eight months. I've seen a lot of ladies out here. 
you know? And, and, and I, 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 the pain of having a baby, I, I just know that it must be terrifying. And, and, and to be on the outskirts of what normal world says, because normal world says you get married and then you have a baby, and so, you know, she's not married, she doesn't know what Joseph's going to say about this or anything. Okay? But she's not afraid. She does ask how. Because it's an interesting question. How? How am I going to have a baby? I, I've learned the facts of life. I know how babies happen. How am I going to have a baby? And so the angel expresses that to her. The Holy Spirit will come down to you and God's power will come over you. So your child will be called the Holy Son of God. You are going to be impregnated through a mystical way through the Holy Spirit. Because this child cannot come from earth. This child is not a son of Adam as everybody else says. This child is a son of God. He's from heaven. He is not from earth. That's why I, I tell you about people who blow off creation. People say, arguing over a virgin birth is not important. Arguing over a virgin birth, birth is very important. Because Jesus did not come from earth. Jesus came from heaven. And if you believe that Jesus just came from earth, it's a whole different ballgame. It changes everything. Jesus came from heaven. And he will be called the Holy Son of God. So God explains and God answers and tells her, and Mary says yes. When she hears the promise, and does she go through hardships? Yes, Mary goes through hardships. You know, we see that, that picture of her traveling on the donkey as they go to Bethlehem. We see the, the pictures of her uh, having the child in a stable. And, and she goes through all these terrible things. She goes, to, she goes to a service at the temple where she commits her son to God. And the, and, and the priest at the temple says, what's going to happen to your son is going to rip your heart out. But she makes a commitment and goes through all of these things for God. Because she believes. And we have to ask ourselves, how do we act when we're challenged by God to do something? When he asks us to do something, how do we react? Then we go to Joseph. Joseph is a, a young man. We know he's a carpenter. He's working and he's doing everything to get enough money together to start his family life and start his business. And he is engaged. And we're sure that he is extremely excited about being engaged because it's the tradition. And he's going to have a family. He's going to have a wife. And he's going to have children. And his business is going to boom. And everything is just going to be fantastic. And he, he's very excited. But then all of a sudden... He gets very confused. Because Mary comes and tells him that she's pregnant. Yeah, you know, we're going to read the scriptures in a minute. And he's even thinking about leaving her. And you got to think of who we are and how we are. That it sounds like the normal thing. <sighs> Son, look at me. Your girlfriend's pregnant and she's saying God did it. Sure, get rid of her now. She's nuts. Does that sound like a pretty reasonable dad? I mean, it didn't sound too crazy, does it? I've heard people before that people, children, guys went home and told their mom and dads they were going into the ministry. And moms and dads have said, You're so gifted, you're so intelligent. Why would you waste your life with that? Why would you do that? You ever heard of that before? And you know, so he's confused and he's going through a whole lot. And the scripture tells us this is how Jesus Christ was born. A young woman named Mary was engaged to Joseph from King David's family. But before they were married, she learned that she was going to have a baby by God's Holy Spirit. Joseph was a good man and did not want to embarrass Mary in front of everyone, so he decided to quietly call off the wedding. 
While Joseph was thinking about this, an angel of the Lord came to him in a dream. Probably Gabriel again. The angel said, excuse me, Joseph, the baby that Mary will have is from the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and marry her. And then after the baby is born, name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So the Lord's promise came true, just as the prophet had said, a virgin will have a baby boy, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. After Joseph woke up, he and Mary were soon married, just as the Lord's angel had told him to do. But they did not sleep together before her baby was born. Then Joseph named him Jesus. You know, this angel probably Gabriel comes... And he comes, and when he talks to Joseph, he prefers to do it in a dream. Which, you know, we all had some pretty weird dreams in our life, right? And he's thinking about this, and he's thinking about what God has said, because Joseph also knew the Word of God. And Joseph knows that this dream is real. So he gets up and he makes this huge commitment in his life. He's going to give up his business because nobody's going to come to business with him because he's marrying an adulteress. He's not going to have anything there. Everybody in the community is going to make fun of him for marrying somebody who's already got somebody else's baby. Plus he's making a commitment to get married and he's not even going to touch his wife for almost a year. He's not going to have any relations with her because the child has to come from God and there can never be any doubt from that. And what does he say? He says, yes. They said, the angel says, name him Jesus. And Joseph says, yes. He does as the father says. Does as the father asks him to do. Believes the announcement and follows through. And, 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 and we look as the story goes on Joseph and Mary go, they have the baby, the angels come, the shepherds come. They, they, they can't get over how this is all coming true. And we have read this over and over and over and over. I, I can remember my parents reading these stories to me when I was like three and four years old. But they would start, and the Christmas season would enter, they would sit down with me and they would read me the stories out of the book of Luke and Matthew. To where when I was five or six years old, I could have passed probably almost a college test on anybody asking this. Because that was, you now my parents also read me, it was the night before Christmas, okay? But they read me this. And I studied it, and I learned it, as I heard it over and over through the years. And I believe it's true. And the church has to make a decision. The church has to step up and say, do we believe it's true? Is it just a nice story? Is it something that we throw out in December just to decorate and look nice? Do we put up our major scenes just because it's the right thing for a Christian home to do? We do throw up our inaccurate ones. I was telling the other day, this was my mom's. So it means a lot to me. But my mom collected nativity scenes. And people ask me all the time, why did your mother collect nativity scenes? Well, in the third grade, my mom went to a class gift exchange and got a real nice gift. Do you remember those? Did you ever have those in school? Where everybody just came in and they brought a $2 gift or a dollar gift and they changed around. And these three girls beat my mom up and took her gift and said, here, take this. And one of the girls had brought a um, camel from a nativity set in their house. And mom took that camel home, and being who my mom was, as that experience bothered her on earth as she grew up, she learned the lesson that she said, instead of being negative about this, I want to make it a positive, and she started collecting camels. That woman had camels everywhere in her house, which, you know, you kind of want to go back in time and get the girl that stuck the camel in her face and bring her in and say, look what you created. <laughs> but you know, the bad thing is, camels were not at Jesus' birth. The camels probably weren't there until Jesus was one or two. And yet, we just stick them in there. But do we believe? Do we believe that this is real? Is this just something that, that 
People tell us a fairy tale. This is just something that is just, like I said, a nice story for Christmas. Or is this as real as Black Friday was? The ads came on TV. The ads came in the newspaper. It really happened. Oh yeah? Oh yeah? Oh yeah. It really happened. Just as the word says, it is who he says it was. It is how he said it was, would be. So Mary says yes. Joseph says yes. And because of their yeses, God is able to bring his perfect son in the world. Because they chose to follow him. And they heard the announcements and they believed and they followed, which leads to us. What do we do with announcements? More importantly, announcements from God. Do we have faith? Do we have faith that the announcements from God are true? Do we believe that we'll never die? Aunt Helen grabbed Dave and Barbara the other night, and she could still talk and was lucid. And she said, Don't let anybody pray for my health. I want to see Jesus. She says, I've been waiting all these years to see Jesus. And I want to see Jesus. So you ask everybody to pray that Jesus gets here quick because he's being too slow. Okay? That's faith. I love it. She didn't say anything about going to see Uncle Bill or her husband, who's been dead for 20 years. She didn't say anything about going to see my mom or my grandparents or anybody like that. She wants to go see Jesus. She knows what he's done. She knows who he is. She has that faith. But do we have that faith? Do we believe? Do we believe in the announcements that come from Jesus? I, I chose this announcement today. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Jesus' 11 disciples went to a mountain in Galilee where Jesus had told them to meet him. They saw him and worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came to them and said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go to the people of all nations and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to do everything that I have told you. I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. Do we believe that we should make disciples? Do we believe that that's important? To reach people for Christ. If you ask people how important it is to reach others for Christ, it's very down the list of their lives. Yet the last thing that Jesus said to all of us was to go make disciples. To go make disciples. To go teach people about Jesus. To constantly, I've been in the ministry, I'm getting ready to head into the ministry for my 23rd year. And, and through my entire life, I've, I've been talking about church growth. And for people to, you know, I, I saw a thing yesterday to talk about it. The number one thing that gets people to come to church is to be invited by a friend. Did y'all know that? And I get some people come up to me and say, well, you know, I don't invite many friends because all my friends are Christians. You don't have a big enough friend circle. You need to start finding people and forming relationships with people who don't have a relationship with Christ. Because every single person that follows Christ has been called to bring people to Christ, not just preachers, not just elders. Every person that has ever made the decision to follow Christ Make disciples. He says, teach my word. Go out and teach my word. You see the Bible illiteracy rate in Christians growing each and every year. And you think, how do you teach my word if you don't know my word? If you can't answer a question about the Bible because you haven't read the Bible, how do you answer it? How, how can you teach my word? And then finally, baptize. You know... There are churches that don't baptize anymore. And it just blows you away. There are churches that don't offer invitations anymore. And it just blows me away because it's, it's 
what we're all about. We're, we're, it's the announcement. He says, make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them my word. That's the announcement. That's what he's telling us to do. He told Mary, you're going to have this baby. And what was her answer? Yes. Nothing is impossible with God. He tells Joseph, and what does Joseph do? Yes. And he names the child Jesus. He tells his church, go do this. And what does the church do? We slack off. We slack off. We think other people will do it. We think it's okay just to live the lives for what we want to do. Do we obey? Not all of us. And then he says that he will be with us till the end of the world. We know what that means. That he's coming back. We're never alone. Do we believe that? There's an announcement. Do you believe that Jesus is with you everywhere you are and everything you're doing? Do you ever talk to him and stuff? Has everybody ever caught you talking to Jesus when you're in the middle of something tough? When you're in the middle of something hard? You know? It's okay. It's a good thing. That's a good thing. Who are you talking to, Jesus? Why? Because I don't think I can do this alone. I need his help. He's right here with me. So I'm asking him to help me. They get kind of shocked. You know, maybe he's picking somebody up. Maybe he's working with somebody. You never know what it is. But you know what? We are never alone. So knowing this stuff, hearing this stuff in his word, do we say yes to his announcements? Do we believe? And then that comes down to that real question. Do you believe that you will see Jesus again? Is it just kind of a thought? Just kind of a notion? Or do you truly believe that you will see Jesus again? Because that's one of the things I think that makes the Christmas story so important. 800 years, I believe, of not a single word from God. They called it the quiet period. And then all of a sudden, bam, all the prophecies start being fulfilled. And all the things that God said start happening. And any day, more and more of God's prophecies will be fulfilled. And soon Jesus will come again. And do we believe that? And are we ready? If you would like to ask Jesus to be your Savior, and to ask Him to forgive you for your sins, we give an invitation that you can come today. If you just need prayer, we give an invitation that you can come today. If you'd like to rededicate yourself and say, you know what? When it comes to that great commission stuff, I, I, maybe I haven't been taking it as seriously as I should. Maybe I haven't been focused on making disciples. If you want to come and pray about that, please come as they sit, stand and sing with them.